support for Able to Learn Air. Green Mountain Support Services to empower neighbors with disabilities to be home in the community. Major support also includes Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Allah Israel, all people, no limits. Hello, welcome to this edition of Able to Learn Air. Television and podcast, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently able. I've always been your host, Lauren Seiler. Arlene is off today, and uh, we'd like to th thank our sponsors, Green Mountain Support Services and Washington County Mental Health, with us to discuss uh, many things with Green Mountain Support Services for this podcast and television program is Joshua Smith, Executive Director of Green Mountain Support Services. Welcome, Josh. Thank you, Lawrence, Thank for having you very me back. Much. And happy and uh, happy New Year. Happy New Year. And um, what exactly is going on this year with Green Mountain Support Services now that we're in 2020? So we're having a lot, what we're really concentrating a lot on is really doing a lot more promotional educational work of uh, what we do. We've been around for 30 years, well, 30 plus years. We've been around for 32 years. And uh, a lot of the people uh, that live in Vermont and around the area still don't know what we do. So we're spending a lot of time doing some, a lot of promotional pieces, a lot of educational pieces. Because ultimately what we do at Green Mountain Support Services is our job is to make sure that people are still at home in their own community. They're not segregated. They're not put off into some sort of segregated assisted living or, or nursing home situation. And we provide services for people with um, all types of disabilities. As we say, disabilities are people that are, you know, we're that disabilities that their people have when they're from, from birth, um, through the happenstance of life. We say that like for a traumatic brain injury. Uh, or as we say, you get it the, through the benefits of age. And I mean the benefits of age because not everybody and your viewers can probably think of 10 or 20 people on, on just on the top of their head. A lot of people don't get to live long enough to have a disability um, through accidents or through anything that might happen to them in life. They, that they don't get that benefit of being older. So uh, the human body is very unique and it breaks down over time. So being able to whether people have to start wearing glasses or, or hearing aids or walk with a cane or having memory loss have issues. Dentures. Per se. Dentures, per se. So whatever the things that, that, that people will, if they're lucky, if they have the, 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 the blessing of life, whatever, they will have a disability. If this, and and so, so the point is, is that what we try to do and we talk to our, our, our employees, our, our direct support professionals, our shared living providers about that as we say, you want to make sure that you're providing the type of services that you're going to want someday. So is that it's so, you know, having a disability, whether it be something that people are, are born with, is that it's that we all need to be make sure that we're all treated with the same dignity and respect um, that we would want to be treated. Because if we're lucky, we are going to be getting the same types of services when we get older. So and so that's that piece is that we're really trying to promote and push is really telling people about really telling people about what that type of service is for Green Mountain Support Services. And we really concentrate a lot on providing that community based support. We want to make sure that, you know, it's actually in the title. Unless you need twenty four hour care nursing, you shouldn't be in a nursing home. Mm -hmm. So being able to be sure that if somebody wants to stay in their neighborhood or stay living on their, uh, on, you know, in their road, um, on their street, that they can do that if, with the help of us trying to find, um, you know, trying to find the uh, a good match for them to to be in their living in their own town still, and you know, with with that said, one point about it, and somebody we we people will always ask us, can I be a shared living provider? What does it take to be a shared? Can I be a shared living provider? Um, you know, for my husband or wife, or can I be a shared living provider for my parents? Can I be a shared living provider for my kids? Depending on that. And, and as we say, a shared living provider is somebody who opens up their home, they get a, a tax-free stipend, kind of like a foster care setup, they get a tax-free stipend to provide a home for somebody with a disability. So the caveat is, is that 
a spouse and a parent cannot be a shared living provider. So, so for instance, I can't be a shared living provider for my wife because as a, as a spouse, you are considered already a natural support to that person. Same thing as a parent. You're considered a natural support. But a child can be a shared living provider for a parent. A grandchild. That's strange. Yeah, no, because if you think about it, a, well, here within our society, the expectation is a parent takes care of a child. There's, there's no expectation that a child takes care of a parent. So if a child will take care of a parent, then what it means is that that, that child um, can be a shared living provider. That child can have their parent move into their home, and then they're able to provide them with, with paid, paid services. We can pay them. We can pay a child to take care of their parent. Mm -hmm. we, can also, we can also pay. So if, if anybody is, is, is talking about, if you're in a situation where you're around the kitchen table and saying, what are we going to do with you know, Uncle Nick? Or what are we going to do with, uh, with, with uh, Grandma Johnson? Uh, so these are the conversations that, and if you say, well, I, you know, we don't want to bring him into a nursing home, so maybe what we can do is provide, can they move in with somebody? That's when you can call us because we can make sure we can provide you with that um, that training and support to have and and and, and that budget to have somebody uh, have your your relative, your grandparent or your aunt, your uncle, or your parent to move into your home. You don't need to do it for free. So we are able to provide that services for you. So what is the side for these today? It completely depends on that. We call it like a difficulty of care. So there is a standard room and board that you get paid, uh, which is the same across the board. Uh, but the, also depending on that difficulty of care, if you have somebody who's still pretty mobile that goes around, then that's they would their difficulty of care would be a, a budget would be a lot would be a lot lower than say uh, somebody who needs help washing or needs help with. Um, uh, they might need help moving around. They might be in a might be in a wheelchair, or they might need some assistive uh, transportation challenges. Those are the things that we're able to. It would be. It would. It would. That difficulty of care would be would cost a bit more. Mm -hmm. So. Um, well, yeah, room and board if you if you factor in hotels. And, and it's still and and by by default it is, it is. On average, it's really about a third of the cost would be for a nursing home setting, or in a, and about a quarter of the nursing cost. Nursing homes are expensive. Yeah, and a, or or a, a quarter of the cost of an assisted living system setup. So, mm -hmm. so if you ask yourself, do I qualify for those services? If you qualify for assisted living, if you qualify for a nursing home, you qualify for the Green Mountain Support Services, services Adult Family Care Program. So, okay. So, um, since you said that. What is the difference between assistive living and shared living provider? Or is there any? There's a big difference. I say one is that an assisted living is basically think about it as kind of like it's like going into like a dormitory. It's like at a university where you're kind of in this congregate setting with everybody else um, that fits there. The difference is that it, it and those are not everywhere. Those assisted living buildings aren't everywhere. You have to move to a different town if you have to. Or you and you might be able to you and you don't have that one-on-one, -on -one, you don't have that one-on-one -on -one support that you would have with moving in with somebody's home. So the benefit of moving in with somebody's home is uh, that you're part of somebody's home. You mm -hmm. you have the benefit of having that one-on-one -on -one support because somebody is able to take you grocery shopping, you know, to take you to other places. You're, and if you, you, you be able to have that, that individualized attention of going to your favorite church or going to your favorite coffee shop, or, or you would say, listen, no, every hunting season, I love going up into like the Johnson Woods and going hunting, oh, like I do that for fishing. years. Going fishing, uh, you know, still being, able, still being able to have maybe that part-time job at the hardware store or still being able to volunteer at the church suppers. You're still going to be able to do that in a shared living provider situation where you'll be limited by transportation and, and who support who is working what hours to come in and help you out with uh, in an assisted living such situation. Oh, okay. So and I would say the I would say I'd put it this way too. The benefit of the assisted living program is that you're surrounded with similar generations of people. So you can you can 
be able to be around people that have same, might have similar life experiences with you. But when you go into a shared living provider situation, you're going to still be able to tap into your social network in the same way. If you go into an assisted living place or, or a nursing home, you have to then create a whole new social network of the people who are around you. Where if you go into an adult family care program, you'll get to be surrounded, you, you'll still be able to access and be connected to your same social network that you've always had. Mm -hmm. But, um, like for example, well, okay, with a direct care support professional, they work in an independent uh, or a group home situation. Yeah. Group home situation, they got to sign in, there's rules. Yeah. You know, so, so a shared living provider just doesn't have rules? Well, they have, they have, they have to follow some very specific guidelines because you're still getting, you're still, it's, a, it's a program you're part of. But think about it that you are actually being part of, like, you're, you're a roommate to somebody. So you actually have the same access and the same, um, the following as whatever those, those house rules are, for mm -hmm. instance, too. So, and you're, you're a roommate. It's, it's the equivalent of having somebody move in. You know, you're moving into some, you're sub, somebody's subletting their room, part of their house to you. So, and the person has to pay rent and stuff. But all that's covered by the adult family care program because it's that room and board that's already, in, that's already part of that. So room, board, food, yep. phone. It's, it's uh, whatever, it's the same situation if you're subletting a room with somebody else. And the benefit that you have with Greenmount Support Services is that we are, uh, in, uh, Greenmount Support Services by far has the most robust and the most um, um, progressive ways to support our shared living providers and also the, the, the best ways to ensure that, you know, they're getting trained, they're, they're getting training and they're getting support. Because we truly believe that um, the best way to support the people we provide services for is by supporting our shared living providers and our direct support professionals and our and our service coordinators. Since you said that, uh, what new things are happening for the, the uh, direct care support professionals? Because one of the things that I'm finding, you know, I know that the direct care support professionals has a Facebook page. Right? The direct support professionals, correct? Yes. Yeah, DSPs. Yeah. And I know the situation is that a lot of the people that work for these agencies who are yeah. DSPs and since you're on the board of the, the DSPs I'm asking this um, on the Facebook page they're putting oh I'm having problem they're not putting names right and stuff but they I'm having problems with this client yeah. that client so on and so forth is this a counseling part to DSPs where they go on this board and, and say what's wrong with, I mean, how, how, how I mean, what can't a, a DSP do, because isn't that breaking HIPAA when it comes to like? Oh, is she talking about the Facebook group that's there? Yeah. So the caveat to that is that if it's a private group, you mm. can say what, there's no HIPAA violation on there in the private group. If it was publicly said in a, in a public, in a public place, then that's where you can have those HIPAA violations. And, but by default, they make sure though is, is that's just purely the, the, the HIPAA piece of saying people's names. But also- They don't the, say people's names, they just say client Yeah, a, and, that's, B. That's, and then that's the point because I know the, mon the, the admins of that Facebook group are very good at um, deleting any post that actually talk about, have, that mention people's like specific names of people. Uh, so the lot of the things that you're seeing on there, and it's it's a great avenue. It's a peer support. The best part about those people sharing stories, and it's about providing that peer support. Because I could say, and this is this 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 um, goes into one of the other things that that we're working on this year as well, mm -hmm. is direct support professionals and shared living providers are unlike, especially here in Vermont, in some states where they have these or some other, some other agencies in Vermont who actually have these 
these um, group homes, which for Green Mount Support Services, we don't believe in group homes. And why is that? Well, because what you do is then you're creating labels of people by saying, oh, there's that autism house, or there's that other house there that uh, with all those people with those challenges. And so it is, is it labels people. And what's the, what we really need to work, what we really need to concern ourselves about here as Vermonters and here as, um, as just as you, who we are is labels can quickly grow into a them and us situation and we don't like that. So it's, we get to be, what's important is that we should be in charge of our own labels. Mm -hmm. We're in charge of who, what we want to identify ourselves as. Lab since you say that, uh, Roy Gustenberger, yeah. our first personal services <clears throat> last week, uh, uh, um, I mean a week and a half ago, uh, uh, um, a week and a half ago, we were talking about labels yeah. and label and labeling pe you know labeling medication bottles and now people. Yeah. Why is it that um, people's perception of people with disabilities they use labels sometimes? Um, oh, he has mental retarded, or he has this, he has that. Why are, are people going away from that? Your because it's not a, it's not us it's not up to us to label other people. It's up to people to label themselves. Mm -hmm. To be proud, like for instance, uh, five years ago, I never would have been labeled as a father, and no one would see if I walked down the street. People don't say, "Oh, there's a father of two daughters." They don't. It's not. They don't see. It's it's important for me to hold that title. It's important for me to tell people about that. Uh, and, you know, do I want to tell people, but I don't walk around and telling everybody, oh, hey, I'm the guy that has to take antacid every night before I go to bed. That's not, that's not up to me to say. That's, or, not, up, or, that's not up to or other I'm people the guy to that, me. Or, <laughs> example, yeah. or, I'm, I'm the or, or I'm the guy that sometimes in the summertime, I got to take two or three showers to smell, to, to smell better, yeah. you know. But so, and that's that point, is that if you're able... If somebody else is able to, it's not up to other people to label somebody. It's up to us to be in charge of how we want to be, how we want to be perceived, and how what we want, what we feel is important to us. So you know, I, I give an example of, you know, the one thing is that, and and, and people who are self advocates and advocates of what we do, uh, of what they do, it's important to them. That's not up to me to say you shouldn't be labeled as somebody with cerebral palsy. That's up to them to say whether or not that's important to them to be labeled. I give an example too as I talk about, uh, you know, that my, you know, you know, like, uh, you know, my, I say, I talk about like my, my, my friend's mother-in-law is a cancer survivor. Uh, is she, does she walk around telling everybody she's a cancer survivor? And no, what are the most important labels for her is that she's a grandmother. Uh, she, um, she's, she's proud to be um, a veteran. These are the labels that she likes. But once a year, she'll go to that, the, that cancer walk because she wants to be surrounded by people who know what she went through. Mm -hmm. Her son and her daughter never had cancer, so they, don't, they, can't, they can't feel and support her on that, but it's important for her once in a while to so, be surrounded by that. So, example, so. ideal with cerebral palsy on a daily basis. Yeah. And I deal with epilepsy on yeah. a daily basis. People that don't deal with epilepsy, yeah. don't know what I'm going through. Yeah. They have to know, is that what you're saying? Yeah, well th that and plus we have to, if anybody is different, it behooves everybody who is different to be surrounded by people that are different than them. Because when we actually go down the street, and so I love coming here to Montpelier, um, seeing people from all different walks of life, different backgrounds, different experiences, sharing the same streets with each other, it just creates an atmosphere of, of, of just like peace and, and, and hope and, and like that we all can learn something from each other. Everybody you walk past to, when I came here for this interview, I walked past, you know, at least 100 people, and every single one of those people 
woke up in the morning and had something. Everybody has their own story to share, and everybody has a different background that makes them different than everybody else. So, it's like what, Sesame Street, in a yeah. sense. Yeah. So whether or not your different, whether your difference is overt or your difference is, is might be more internal. Everybody has internal internal struggles. Everybody has in that. Everybody has their own successes, and everybody has a story to share. So the, the 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 most important thing about that, as we're talking about, is that when you start segregating people from different group homes here and then different nursing homes here, if you start taking away people for, out of the the main part of society, then you start creating this them culture. There's a them. There's the, they're over there. They're over there. It's like. The example I gave where it goes somebody, don't, if you go into a restaurant, yeah. let's say if you go into a restaurant with a deaf person, yeah. don't, a lot of, um, don't assume the person like, or you know, the waiter or waitress, yeah. don't assume the person can't speak, just ask him yeah. or her what he, he or she wants, yeah. don't, you know, don't assume. Right, and you know, and it's important that we all have the same accesses to the same. We, we all can access the same things, which is important. And I'll give you an example of that. Is um, when I first came back from Doctors Without Borders, I I worked in New Hampshire, and Roy was my supervisor. So I actually know Roy ahead of you. Yeah, yeah. So we came into a new office, and this was one of those epiphany moments for me when I started working in, um, you know, in the uh, field of disabilities. Which is what uh, epiphany? So let me tell you. So we moved into a new office. It was a bigger. It was a big office. It had a big kitchen. And I w went into Roy's off. I went into Roy's office and I, his his room. And I said, "Hey, Roy, I have an idea. So we have a lot of the, we have a lot of people we're working with who who are struggling to learn how to cook. Can we on the weekends, you know, you know, with you know, the people that we provide services for, have them come and maybe do a cooking class here in the office?" Mm -hmm. And he looked at me and he said, absolutely not. And I thought it was a great idea. I'm like, why, why couldn't I do that? And he goes, where do you go to learn how to cook? And I was like, I guess I learned how to cook ah. at home. I learned how to cook at a, take a cooking class. He said, like, exactly. Just because people have a disability doesn't mean they shouldn't have the same access as everybody else. When you actually start segregating out people to have separate... Uh, separate experiences mm -hmm. with every out, outside of every every what everybody else is experiencing. But you are creating a segregated. But what culture. happens? Okay, everybody's normal, right? But what happens if a person with a special need, like example, yeah. uh, I'm as normal as they come. Uh, disability goes out the window a lot of time. Yeah. I went to Kona Institute of America in, in New York. I only was able to stay um, the summer. Yeah. Thing. It didn't work out for me. So I got culinary training somewhere else. What happens w with a person with this person if something doesn't work? Oh, that's a fact of life. How do you, how, some people deal with it differently. Some people, well, it's, it's about what, you know, it's also is based off of, you know, what your support system's there. And plus, here's the thing, everybody learns differently. There's not two ways to learn. There is hundreds of ways to learn. So it's either based off of, you know, pace of how you explain it. It has to be maybe more tactile. How, how would somebody take a cooking class who's blind? How would someone take a cooking class who's blind? Somebody, somebody uh, did MasterChef who was blind. So and, and that's the point. It doesn't matter if, it doesn't matter what, and as I say, everybody, and if we're lucky enough, we all will have a disability someday. And just because you all of a sudden have to wear glasses or harder hearing or you can't walk, or you have a traumatic brain injury, that doesn't mean by default you are taken away from society. You still have every right to be a part of what everybody else is a part of. So it's up to those classes, up to those teachers, it's up to those schools, it's up to whatever that situation is, is to make sure that you are accessible for everybody who can do that. So, you know, and the, and the, and the piece of it is, is like, you know, one example is, People are talking about. Have you ever seen Braille on uh, ATM? Yes, and, the I have. and it's just like, and you know, and then, and then the, the uninitiated people would say, "Well, why would you put Braille on an ATM? It's not like you know, it's not like people with, you know, that uh, that have uh, that have sight issues can't drive, and you know, and the and that's the natural response is Pe people that are blind. Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. people that are blind, and I I know a lot of, of visually impaired blind people. Yeah. 
they fold their money differently. So they're able, okay, this is a 20, yeah. this is a 5, this is a 100, so, and they know what they're handing them because of the way they fold it. Yeah. So uh, it's a way of adapting, correct? Right. But I was going to say, but the point is, is that, that, that people who are visually impaired still are in cars. They might be, they're not driving, but they're passengers, and they still get to access the same things everybody else gets to access. So that's that, that's that caveat to say it's, that it's, that the world that we live in should be accessed by everybody who lives in the world. So and if there's segregation, it makes it worse. It'll always make it worse. Prejudice too. No? Yes, because you created them culture, and that's not what we want. We want to make sure that everybody has the same accessibility to everything that everybody else has. Yeah, um, including re including religious services. Yeah, including yeah. Yep, everything. Um, now, uh, there's a conference I know that's happening with the direct care worker uh, coming up in 2020. They have them every year. They have the yeah the the National Alliance for Direct Support Professionals. We actually end up have we do have um, in Cleveland this not Cleveland no it was in Cleveland last year. Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, I can't remember. So they have it every year. They have the, um, their National Alliance for Direct Support, for the NADSP. So, um, so viewers or listeners, please check out nadsp.org. Mm -hmm. It's the National Alliance for Direct Support Professionals. And they, are, they provide a lot of robust support and uh, um, trainings and, uh, and education for mm -hmm. direct support professionals. Okay. Uh, what... Um, in terms of uh, Green Mile Support Services, okay. Uh, anything else that's coming up this year that we should know about? Uh, we are, as I say, a lot of it we're doing is a lot of education pieces. We're doing a lot of, per, you know, is um, awareness mm -hmm. trainings. Um, we're, and that's that's what we're that's our main focus this year. Can you describe some of them? Well, a lot of it we're we're also promoting the eBadge Academy. That's part of the Direct Support Professionals, the NADSP, mm -hmm. which is a uh, it's a training platform for direct support professionals. Um, we're you know we're also really pushing our you know our our person centered thinking. And I know we had a couple of our person centered thinking trainings trainers in here. Brenda Donnelly came once to talk about uh, person centered thinking. So we're doing some trainings on that. Uh, we're also doing a lot of work with our, our um, you know, therapeutic options trainings. Uh, so, and as I say, most of it is just to, you know, this year we're really just focusing a lot on the educational piece to let people know because what if we you, do. Yeah, if, if you don't focus on the educational piece and you go to try to find a job yeah. in that particular area, yeah. it's not going to work because you don't yeah. have education. Yeah. Yeah, and we're really working a lot on pushing our shared living providers, letting them know, um, giving them all the support they need, and letting the general public know that being a shared living provider is a great opportunity for well over half the population here, and they just don't know about it yet. Mm -hmm. So um, Last year, I know we touched on it, but maybe we could touch on it again. Um, direct support professionals, as far as like, you know, naming the profession. Um, some places call it um, personal personal care attendant, yeah. nurses aid, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Can you kind of break those barriers again? Yeah, as I say, it's they're called direct support professionals, DSPs. That's the title. That's the publicly recognized name. That's the name that's given. And 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 I, and I say it just it's a it's a bee in my bonnet when I hear people call them different names because. If you call them different things, it loses the significance and it loses the it loses the the, the power that we that they need to support uh, and actually have the that advocacy. Though? It'd be the same thing if you call uh, if they called nurses different names or lawyers different names or 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 take any profession or teachers calling teachers different names. Is that you, if they somebody calls them something else in one school and calls a teacher something else in the other, then it's hard for people to recognize it as a singular profession because every place is calling them differently. So I'm proud to say there's been there's 16 of us agencies that do work with this, people with disabilities 
There's 16 agencies in the state, and about, I think, five of us so far are actually calling them direct support professionals like we're supposed to. Where we still have 11 other agencies are still kind of straggling, um, not calling them by the actual title that they're, that they're called nationally. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. Um, and, and NADSP has been around for how long? They've been around for a long time. Uh, probably over 15 years or so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But before that, we're talking about like, so, so there never used to be a title direct support professional? The, there, there, ha, there, there has been, but other, it's, it's not known enough to where the other agencies know that that's actually what they're called. Okay. So they call them, as you say, personal care attendants, community support workers, um, caregivers, uh, you know, personal service attendants, or whatever. But the point is, they're called direct support professionals. That's the name. That's what they're called. Please, agencies, call them direct support professionals. That's what they're called. Okay. So. Um, uh, so being that it's 2020 and we're in this new administration yep. with all the things being cut, um, how does it look for services for people with disabilities? You know, it's, I think a lot of the Long people, and short of it. Yeah, the long and short of it is um, there's always, always self-advocates parents and guardians, they hold so much power when it comes to advocating for services, well more than agencies do. Uh, you take somebody like you who's a great self-advocate, um, you're the equivalent of 20 executive directors in the legislature. I am. <laughs> Your voice means more than, because if, if executive directors or people who work in human services go there and, and advocate for services, it looks self-serving. Mm -hmm. But if people with uh, people that have disabilities, and well, people how that are is it self-serving? Self for let's say, if an uh, executive director has challenges, how would that be self-serving? Well, if it's a, if it's an executive director who's also a, a self-advocate, someone that has a disability, then that's good. But either way, it's the paycheck. Is that the you know the the ta the the legislators, the you know the, rep the people that are in these committees just see it see it self-serving. But when you have parents and guardians. And self-advocates, people that live with a disability, go there and say, this is what we need, this is what we need, um, this is why it's important to us. That means a heck of a lot more mm -hmm. than anybody who is paid to be there. Mm -hmm. I promise you that. I mean, yeah, we, you know, we do it because it needs to be done yep. as far as the advocacy is concerned. Well, I would like to thank you for joining me on this edition of Able to Learn On Air podcast and program. Uh, for more information on Green Mountain Support Services, what, uh, what people can go to www.gmss.org. Yep. Gmssi.org. Okay. Yeah. So, for more information on Green Mountain Support Services and what they do, go to www.gmssi.org. Uh, the number is. So, and also, if you want to, you're more than welcome to actually. You know, we have two offices. We have an office in Morrisville, Vermont. And we also have an office in St. Johnsbury, Vermont. So if you'd like to, you know, it's as, as, as Lawrence was saying, um, visit our website. It's uh, gmssi.org. Mm -hmm. um, or give us a call at 802-888-7602. That's 802-888-7602. Or our St. Johnsbury office. Um, which is 802-424-1636. Well, I would like to uh, thank uh, Josh Smith again, Executive Director of Green Mountain Support Services, for joining us for this podcast, this informative podcast, and uh, television program of Able Then On Air. For more information on Able Then On Air, you can go to um, www.orcamedia.net. That's O-R-C-A-M-E-D-I-A -E dot net. And those that want to catch my, um, my column in the Parkchester Times, uh, in, I know it's in the Bronx, but it's also online. Uh, it's able to speak up. It's a, uh, it's a column about, for and about people with special needs and, um, you know, what uh, different topics 
that uh, they go through, that we go through, you can go to www.parkchestertimes.com. That's P-A-R-K, Chester Times. Dot com. This puts an end to this edition of Able to on Air. Again, Arlene Seiler is not here today. Uh, we would like to thank our sponsors, Green Mountain Support Services and Washington County Mental Health. This puts an end to this edition of Able to on Air. I'm Lauren Seiler. See you next time. But before we go, next week um, we will have um, Chris Samaritan Haven and Judy Joy, and we will be talking about homelessness in 2020. Stay tuned for that. See you next time. Major support for Able to Learn Air. Green Mountain Support Services to empower neighbors with disabilities to be home in the community. Major support also includes Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Allah Israel, All People No Limits, and the OSEM Group, working to get better for you at any moment.